Good evening and welcome to the Urban Design Committee. I'm David Gamble, one of the co-chairs of the committee with uh, Shauna Gillis-Smith. Uh, we have a great speaker tonight. Uh, thank you all for coming. Felipe Correa is a uh, principal of Somatic Collaborative uh, based in uh, Brooklyn in New York City and also in Ecuador. He's also chair of the Urban Design Department at the Graduate School of Design and an associate professor. Uh, so we're really glad to have Felipe here. A couple quick announcements. Uh, if you need continuing education credits, please sign in up front. Uh, restrooms are, are right down this corridor. And if you uh, hang out after the lecture, there's a reception uh, just across the atrium uh, together with the Emerging Professionals Network that's uh, doing a, a speed mentoring session. <laughs> so it uh, should be interesting. So please join us for pizza and, and drinks afterwards if you can. Uh, the Urban Design Committee always meets the third Thursday of the month. Uh, Dennis Pipers will be here on October 18th. Uh, in November, there's an, an ABX panel on uh, the urban campus. Uh, so we'll have a session actually over in the convention center. And in December, it'll be a bit of a holiday party and a Pecha Kucha. So we're looking for volunteers to help us uh, on the December meeting. Special thanks to Connor and Mary for helping to organize this. And with no further ado, uh, Felipe. Very good. Well, um, good afternoon, good evening. And uh, thank you very much for the invitation to both uh, uh, David, Shauna, and Connor uh, for helping out with all the, uh, uh, the logistics as well. Uh, I'm very happy to be here and to be able to present some of the most recent work that we've actually been uh, uh, developing in the studio. Uh, and rather than presenting specific projects, even though I am going to present specific projects, uh, I hope that I can actually sort of develop the presentation uh, in a manner that we can actually sort of uh, examine the projects more through sort of uh, particular scales of interest and also uh, uh, certain techniques, certain design methodologies and techniques that might begin to inform um, those particular scales. Uh, and to uh, uh, sort of, and before I actually get to uh, the specific projects, I want to introduce uh, the framework of the lecture through a series of ideas that I think have been extremely influential uh, in the way that we actually think uh, and process either both the sort of applied research uh, and design projects at uh, um, uh, at the studio. Uh, and one of those ideas for me has to do with this distinction between motivation and technique. Uh, and I think that. Uh, in this case, sort of uh, uh, Paul Valéry's uh, uh, personification of an architect um, in uh, um, ancient Greece, Epaulinos, uh, pair, paired with uh, uh, Paul Clay's uh, uh, pedagogical sketchbook, begins to un sort of unfold uh, this idea of the architect as a synthesizer of uh, uh, multiple ideas, sort of as an agent that actually brings synthesis into the into the equation by being able to sort of abstract larger ideas about the, the built environment. Uh, paired with, uh, uh, I think, Paul Clay's idea of the line in action, uh, this idea of sort of uh, that has to do with sort of um, certain representational techniques uh, that are unique to the discipline that allow us to visualize and put in the forefront uh, uh, sort of a, a variety of ideas about space. Uh, I think for me another uh, important component uh, in the way that we've developed our practice uh, has to do with the distinction between research and practice. Uh, and beyond uh, sort of this idea that research informs practice or that, uh, uh, that practice informs research, uh, for me, these two are very different conduits. Uh, and depending on the question that you're asking, one particular uh, conduit might be better than the other. Uh, in the case of research, uh, I think it allows you to actually expand and explore certain ideas uh, when you don't have a specific answer. I think that practice allows you to sort of, uh, once again, bring synthesis. Uh, and be able to test in a more immediate manner many of the, uh, uh, of the ideas that you can expand through research. Uh, and I think that this dialogue for us has been very productive uh, in the way that we've developed uh, um, the studio. Um, and finally, the third condition has to do uh, with this distinction between uh, uh, a transcalar attitude towards scale rather than a specialized scale. Uh, and we always sort of joke uh, uh, around that we rather be amateurs at a multiplicity of scales than actually specialists in a single scale. Uh, and for us, this ability to be able to migrate uh, uh, across scales and, uh, for, and uh, allow one particular scale to inform another is something that has, uh, um, uh, that has been critical for us. Uh, 
sort of uh, it has been critical in allowing us to develop an interest that goes from sort of fairly small material fragments, like in the case of a um, uh, of a gate we did to a series of gardens in Ecuador, uh, and range all the way to sort of larger investigations uh, like uh, uh, the dynamic atlas, which begins to examine sort of forms of urbanization along the Ganges River in uh, um, uh, in India. Uh, so within that framework, uh, I want to present a series of projects that cut across a variety of scales, uh, and primarily present the way that we've actually uh, that we've actually uh, thought the project through. And the first one is a competition we actually did a, a few years back for uh, uh, for the Magog district in Seoul, for which we actually got third prize. Unfortunately, we didn't win, uh, or fortunately, because uh, uh, actually the project is being reworked as uh, as we speak, so there might be a chance for uh, for a second version of the competition. But the act but actually, uh, the competition brief asked for a new research and development complex uh, on the western edge of. Uh, 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 of Seoul, uh, primarily with a focus of, uh, uh, of sort of developing a new research and development city. Uh, and we were actually fascinated uh, with the premise uh, of the project, but more important than the premise of the project, of course, there's sort of Seoul, uh, a closer zoom, uh, and the site is actually this point here. And we were actually fascinated with the site uh, because in addition to being uh, so in addition to the scale of the project, it was actually the last greenfield site uh, in the urbanized area, uh, a site that because of its polder condition, because it was actually below the, uh, the water level of, uh, um, uh, of the river, depending on the fluctuation of the river, it actually had resisted a lot of urbanized pressures until today when actually the costs of, uh, um, uh, uh, of sort of waterproofing the site uh, were, uh, were sort of paired with the benefits of actually constructing it, uh, made it feasible to, uh, um, uh, to intervene. But before we actually went into the project, um, I was always fascinated um, uh, with Seoul. And one of the things that always fascinated me about the city is that in the course of 50 years, they were able to change a floodplain that sort of originally looked like this, right? A system of a floodplain, a system of streams that actually uh, made up the larger Han River into a catalyzed figure that became the main organizational principle uh, for the city. So there was a huge effort, like we've seen in many other uh, rivers, to actually create a, a, a straight jacket that defined the edges, where you can begin to see sort of the way that sort of heavyweight infrastructures then begin to be played. Convention center here, and somehow created a multiplied ground where the convention center would occupy the ground floor. This would give us uh, a raised surface that could actually then be fractured with air rights, and then the campus could actually sit on top of that surface, being able to bridge over the uh, um, over the flood wall. And here you see the relationship of uh, 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 of the section with the convention center below, parking infrastructure uh, in between, and then a raised park with the campus subdivided above. Uh, and finally, uh, the last uh, um, uh, operation that we proposed had to do with the creation of the district by rethinking the relationship of the uh, um, sort of the, the, this whole super block, uh, which is sort of in many ways uh, a very specific construction formula that has been sort of tested uh, over time. Sort of the, the efficiency that they can actually build these labs is quite unique. So what we actually proposed was to maintain the logic of this lab but be able to organize the 200 by 400 block uh, with a double grid, one that was actually a sort of road network and one that was a larger green tissue that would begin to diversify the fronts that you can actually have in relation to, uh, um, uh, uh, sort of begin to diversify the, 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 the four fronts of the block. And from there begin to develop uh, a matrix, sort of more of a parametric matrix that would actually allow you to accommodate varying degrees of density depending on sort of a, a certain requirements of location. You know, if you were closer to a, a, to a major avenue having larger sort of a, a building floor plates, if you were towards the interior, they became more residential. But this became sort of a, a range of densities that then can actually infill the, uh, um, the grid. And you can see it there uh, more in detail, the process of transformation. And then the way that actually multiple hands, uh, mo multiple design agents, could actually begin to give shape uh, to the different blocks, uh, all the way from sort of one block, one architect, uh, 
to a, a multiplicity of architects working within one particular block. Uh, and finally, the last operation, which actually uh, sort of uh, brought this sort of larger grid, uh, th this new sort of botanical grid that we were proposing, working with the topography and a series of mounds that existed in the area, to be able to create a new, a new form of uh, a storm management uh, um, drainage that would then sort of drain towards the marina. Uh, and then in this process, we would begin to accommodate a series of recreational and open spaces that also had um, that also accommodated a series of, uh, of new species. And one of the things that we actually discovered is that Seoul is one of the major destinations for migratory birds. Uh, and part of the project actually looked at bringing sort of uh, a space where migratory birds could actually begin to occupy part of the uh, um, uh, part of the wetlands. Uh, there's a view of the uh, um, uh, of the campus, and. Uh, um, Sort of with the, the sort of the, the layered uh, convention center below, and then the campus above. Uh, a view of the sort of raised campus connecting to the river, uh, and then sort of uh, the phasing strategy that was proposed for the project. That's uh, sort of the winning entry, uh, Samu, a very large, uh, sort of a very large uh, uh, Seoul-based uh, uh, based office, and those were sort of uh, our boards. Uh, unfortunately, they, uh, uh, we didn't win, but the competition also, the project was uh, um, extremely overscaled, uh, even in salt terms, uh, in the way that the brief was written, and is actually now being rethought in, uh, and I think in more modest terms. Uh, the next project that I actually want to uh, uh, describe right now uh, has to do with the city of Quito, uh, which is actually my hometown. Uh, and for me, working in uh, uh, Quito was uh, extremely uh, important and interesting because it's the city where I had actually um, where I had actually grown but a city where I was never trained in terms of uh, in terms of design so uh, it, when going back and sort of engaging the city for me it was very I begin to think uh, of a working project of a working process that would allow me to rethink the city that for many years I lived in but I never sort of uh, understood in sort of larger architectural and uh, in urban terms and of course the city is uh, sitting 10,000 feet above sea level uh, in the middle of the uh, um, Andean Valley. Uh, this is what Alexander von Humboldt actually called the avenue of the volcanoes. In any given day, you can actually see five or seven uh, uh, snow-capped volcanoes that are called the gardens of the city. And uh, um, uh, when it's clear, it's, it's quite amazing to see sort of uh, this ring of fire that surrounds the, uh, uh, the city. But of course, something that's quite fascinating is that if in the 1500s, uh, the city was a colonial grid sort of embedded in a perch valley surrounded by ravines. Today, it's a city of almost 3 million people, right, that actually has the historic core at this point, but really an overextended linear city that now is getting another parallel city around this area. This is approximately uh, 10,000 feet, and this is approximately seven or 8,000 feet. So, uh, when I actually uh, first started looking at the city, uh, we began to develop these series of drawings that actually spoke more uh, about a way of understanding uh, the city and its relationship to extreme topography. Uh, and one of the things that's actually fascinating for me about the city is that a city that at first hand seems to be extremely continuous because you always have the visual connection of the, uh, um, of the panorama. Uh, when, you actually, uh, um, uh, when you actually begin to look at it in section, the relationship of ravines and cavities within the topography make a city that's visually extremely continuous, uh, physically extremely discontinuous, requiring a large amount of investment on, uh, 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 on heavy infrastructure, primarily the act of infilling and bridging, that has been a main um, issue in the way that the city has actually been, uh, uh, has actually been conceived. So within this context, uh, we actually began to develop three uh, uh, hypotheses about the city. Uh, one for the historic core, uh, one for the compact expansion, right, the 20th century expansion, the uh, uh, sort of uh, the compact capital adjacent to the historic core, and new forms of development uh, that are actually happening in the lower valleys. And of course, uh, if we actually take a look at the historic core, uh, the model of development was fabric as driver, where through a process, so, so where the, the, uh, the through the law of Indies, a colonial grid was imposed, and this grid was forcefully molded to the topography by infilling ravines. So as you can see here, 
blocks actually enlarge or reduce to be able to negotiate with an extreme topography that, uh, 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 that de define the location. Uh, if we actually look at it today, this is part of a, uh, a series of drawings that we're doing for a new historic preservation trust fund uh, that is being established for the city. But you can still begin to see the historic core has become sort of extremely well, uh, uh, well preserved, the first World Heritage Site in the world, primarily because of this relation to, uh, um, uh, to the ravines. Uh, what the city has not been able to do uh, is to actually overcome mm -hmm. the fact that the boundaries were filled uh, with very heavy uh, um, uh, mobility infrastructure, very heavy roads that today as the new metro line is being introduced with the station there, we are actually allowed to, uh, uh, we are in the possibility to be able to rethink these particular edges and understand how can you actually establish a better connection between the historic core and the northern uh, uh, portions of the city. Of course, as you actually move uh, towards the compact capital, the idea of the, uh, um, uh, of the colonial grid was no longer possible. The scale of development and the extremity of the topography did not allow for that. So a new model actually emerges, and it's a model where the block, rather than being repetitive, it becomes iterative. Uh, and it's a very interesting model because it actually responds through parcel structure and contour, completely responds to the topography, uh, creating a system in which you never have two blocks that are exactly the same. They are always different because the slope is always changing. Uh, and this relationship between contour and uh, parcel structure became the main driver that actually defined the majority of blocks, particularly at the periphery of, uh, uh, of the valley. And then finally, uh, the lower valleys, sort of the newer part of the city, that have primarily uh, sort of developed as sort of new forms of gated community, uh, uh, sprawl, not unlike many other parts of the world, that are sort of beginning to uh, replicate a much lower density city, about 400 meters below uh, the upper city, uh, creating a very complex uh, geographical figure. Here we actually see the, the city, the upper valley, the lower valley. And here you can begin to see sort of the contemporary network of the city being accentuated with the introduction of the new airport. This is the existing airport, which is more like a train station because it's right in the middle of the city. Uh, but unfortunately, it's closing in, uh, um, in February. I say unfortunately because I live right next to it. But uh, um, uh, once the new airport opens, a new dynamic of the upper valley and lower valley is going to, uh, 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 to sort of further compound the urbanization of, uh, um, of the lower valley. Uh, within this context, we actually just, uh, um, uh, we just presented about six months back uh, this project to, uh, uh, to the municipality that has to do with the uh, uh, restructuring of a fine grain open space, a very small project, but a critical project in relationship to, uh, um, uh, to the connection between the historic core and uh, uh, the newer extensions towards the north of the city. Um, the historic core is right here. This is the Alameda Park. Uh, in the Spanish American city, the Alameda is sort of the place that used to be um, sort of the open grounds and the market, sort of the commons in, in many ways. Uh, and of course, a park of uh, extreme civic value in the city. And then adjacent to the Alameda, you have actually this particular site. This is the uh, provincial government, the government of the province of uh, uh, Pichincha. And of course, uh, as many projects of the 70s and 80s, um, it was built over a lot of controversy. Uh, and by the moment that they actually sort of finished the tower and the platform, they ran out of money for the landscape. So it ended up being something like that, a completely sort of disinvested, uh, uh, disinvested open space until recent years uh, when the municipality actually uh, it made a conscious effort that a space like this could actually not be in front of, uh, um, uh, of a park of such, of, of such importance as, uh, um, as the Alameda. And actually, they uh, uh, asked for a project that would somehow uh, give a new identity to the plaza and somehow be able to connect it to the park and not to the administrative tower or, or somehow establish a dialogue between the two but to actually detach it significantly from, uh, 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 from the administrative power. That, that's the existing, uh, um, uh, the existing site uh, and this is here uh, our proposal. And one of the interesting things about this project was that well, it actually seems like an extremely flat surface the sectional difference between this edge, because of the topography, the sectional difference between this street and that street uh, 
is actually five meters, which uh, allowed for the project to be a, um, a surface in terms of open space, but actually to have a, um, what can we do? I think this is maybe too close to, uh, to me. There we go. Is that better? Yeah. Um, but actually had a certain thickness that would allow you to, uh, uh, to incorporate additional program that could activate the space. Uh, so for us, the first question when uh, uh, reworking the project had to do uh, primarily with this relationship between the site and the park. And how do you actually begin to construct a project that is complementary to the Alameda Park without actually replicating or taking uh, away from the importance of, uh, uh, of the park? Uh, so in a way, we actually began to look at this particular district, uh, uh, at the particular structure of the district, the way it actually connected to the historic core, the connections to the north, but the fact that actually along this axis, it connected the two major museums in the city, two old hospitals that now have been transformed into uh, um, the Museum of Contemporary Art in a very important, uh, uh, in, a, in a very important sort of contemporary gallery on this side. And we actually thought that this space could actually be a middle point between the two and could actually accommodate a more informal gallery that uh, um, could actually serve for younger uh, uh, forms, sort of for younger artists in the city, which today do not have access to the more institutionalized uh, museums represented by these two pieces. Uh, in addition, we actually sort of began to define this as a critical point uh, or as a critical joint uh, in relationship to the introduction of the new metro system that's uh, uh, right now under construction in the city. So we actually decided uh, to rather than just rethink it as a, sing as a single surface, to uh, begin to think of it in terms of three separate spaces, a completely public space that would actually front the main street, a semi-private space that would then be flanked, um, uh, that would then be flanked by the new gallery, and then another space, a new sort of elevated garden that would actually serve as the botanical nursery for the trees that need to be replaced in the older park. So in a way, you would actually have this space always open to the public, this space that's actually controlled by sliding gates on both sides, that also has the entrance to a theater that uh, uh, exists underneath this piece, and then the third space with controlled access that would be the elevated platform that would take you to this point that cantilevers off to the street where you get an incredible view of both the historic core, the center of the city, and the north in, uh, um, in the other side. So in terms of the phasing, we actually looked at first uh, breaking the structure of the uh, super block, removing that platform, reorganizing the levels of, uh, um, uh, reorganizing the, levels of, the uh, uh, of the platform, creating this L-shaped piece that would incorporate the gallery, a restaurant, reorganizing the entrance to the theater, and then sort of the raised uh, uh, garden on top, and then actually establishing two new bridges that would create a much more sort of controlled entrance to the, uh, uh, to the, uh, um, uh, to the government building, but that would actually keep two separate identities in terms of the, uh, um, in terms of the two projects. Uh, and then, of course, going back to one of uh, sort of uh, the most interesting figures that has ever been in the city, Alexander Van Humboldt, we began to use uh, his section as a point of departure to begin to think of a botanical strategy that would bring uh, vegetation from altitudes between 3,500 meters to about 2,000 meters that could begin to create the canopy of the elevated garden um, that you see above, of the nursery that you see above. There you see a rendered view of the picture and then the section that actually, uh, 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 the section that actually integrates to the theater below. Uh, and then some of the views of the space going up to the elevated, uh, um, uh, elevated garden. Uh, and then a series of views of the way that the space actually then integrates and connects to the other park. And finally, the more public space connected through the street in this particular piece. Uh, the next project that I actually want to uh, 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 to show is a competition we did a while back that had to do with uh, um, sort of the infilling of, uh, um, of senior citizen housing in Nova uh, Novato, California. Uh, and I, we actually did this competition uh, 
because we were absolutely fascinated by uh, um, uh, sort of by how to actually begin to deal with contexts of extreme, extreme low density. We also found uh, um, quite uh, um, unique that they would actually select two sites in absolutely steep topography in, uh, um, in California and then actually sort of introduce a program like senior citizen housing that has an inherent need for, um, uh, for horizontality. So for us, those two issues are what, uh, uh, what led us to, to begin to think uh, uh, about, the, uh, uh, about the project. And of course, this is the site. Uh, and you were given two sites this one and this one, that actually had already been sort of terraced in a way. Uh, there, there had been some sort of land movement, but the competition asked for uh, the construction of, I think, uh, 15 or 16, a maximum of 15 or 16 units on each site. And when we actually began to look at the logic of, uh, there you see a view of the sites, at the logic of the project, we were always very interested with this pattern that was being developed in which sort of rings of density always followed roads uh, and then forest was allowed to actually uh, exist within uh, sort of the interior of these sort of very odd super blocks, if you want to call them that. And for us, the idea of having two parcels seemed to be extremely intrusive to that particular, uh, uh, to that particular system. So what we actually proposed had to do more with actually finishing and being able to complete the ring and be able to then give back a lot of this space to the larger sort of forest systems that, uh, 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 that traverse it. So the first operation that we proposed was to actually to transfer the development rights from one parcel to the other, give this one back, sort of uh, t turn this one into sort of to a larger sort of park, um, uh, to a larger sort of forested area, and consolidate the density along this site, which already had access to a series of basic services, street, water, electricity, so on. So then we actually uh, decided to use the existing terracing system to be able to develop a, uh, um, a system that would capitalize on the terrace and actually begin to create a series of horizontal platforms that would then, that would then thin out towards the topography. Uh, and you can begin to see here a series of typological studies uh, that began to give us uh, units from one, sort of from studios to two to three bedrooms but then sort of some uh, pieces that would actually also allow you to, uh, um, uh, to create intermediary units for, um, uh, for sort of healthcare assistance or that could be actually used for rental in, uh, um, uh, by, by, sort of by, by the owners of the unit to be able to assist in uh, uh, sort of in uh, um, raising income levels. And here you can begin to see sort of the way that the units then begin to aggregate in such a way that sort of the project always has a horizontal surface. And then the lower portion of the project becomes parking for the units, uh, uh, for the units below. So you can see here, access is always through the top. You begin to access to a series of sort of units, sometimes with private courtyards, sometimes with shared courtyards. And then parking happens below for the system below. So everything begins to work in a, um, in a horizontal manner. And then as you actually go into the steeper part of the topography, we actually proposed uh, a series of agricultural gardens that were part of the requirements of the competition. But then these gardens uh, fade and become uh, um, sort of uh, part of a forest, uh, a larger forest that could become part of a carbon trade, uh, a carbon trade system. There you can do a view of some of the pieces below. And then sort of the larger sort of structure of each of these pieces that then repeat and stagger uh, stagger upwards. Um, and then I think finally the, uh, the, uh, um, the last and actually the longest project that I want to show today is the work that we've actually been doing in, uh, um, in the Phoenix Tucson mega region. Sort of uh, Arizona report frameworks for a well-tempered urbanism in the American Southwest. Uh, and this is actually a research project that began with a Graham Foundation grant and now has continued to be funded through a series of, uh, uh, of think tanks in Arizona. Uh, and begins to look at the relationship between fast-paced forms of urbanization, uh, fast-paced forms of urbanization, and uh, uh, the larger morphologies that these begin to generate within this context. Uh, and uh, in a way, the uh, uh, the investigation departs from uh, from this particular diagram, which I actually um, uh, find it extremely problematic. Uh, 
uh, because it actually begins to define the entire continental United States, or actually the entire, entire North America, uh, as a series of spreads and densities that all have the same quality. Of course, sometimes they're bigger, sometimes they're smaller, but everything is either sort of urbanized or, uh, um, uh, or not urbanized. And if we actually begin to look, I, I think, more nuanced readings of these particular uh, areas, you begin to see that sort of within that map, there are, as sort of the, uh, um, uh, the Regional Plan Association has identified, specific mega regions that could begin to be conceived as a larger sort of management unit uh, uh, and that if analyzed as a, a continuous whole might begin to give certain pointers about how to begin to, uh, um, to intervene and manage uh, these regions at a much larger scale. So of course we were interested in the Sun Corridor but began to develop I think an analysis of all the different mega regions uh, and in primar and we were uh, very interested also in understanding that once again, as I said before, they're not all equal. That if we actually begin to look at the relationship between building grain, open space, street dimensions, and so on, in many different sort of uh, uh, mega regions throughout the country, all of them begin to respond to a very different time period, to very different environmental conditions, to very different uh, uh, um, uh, technologies that built them. And within the larger sort of uh, scope of the American landscape, I think uh, you find much more diversity than. Uh, uh, than similarities. In the case of the Rust Belt, you find a series of geometries that are associated to sort of decaying industry that are very different, for example, than the geometries associated with the Gulf Coast uh, and the more sort of littoral conditions of, uh, um, uh, uh, of the Gulf. Uh, and finally, for us, uh, it was also very interesting to begin to understand, sort of to rethink uh, geographies uh, and techniques for geographies that are outside of the, con of the consolidated city. I think that if we actually look at the, uh, uh, at the discipline of architectural landscape of design at large in terms of the city, uh, I think sort of the symbolic centers of capital have developed a series of methods and techniques that are quite, uh, 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 that are quite reasonable and quite successful. But when we begin to go outside of these consolidated areas, uh, we begin to see, I think, uh, uh, a lack of technique and a need of new sort of forms of invention to be able to deal with these geographies. So here you begin to see the Phoenix Tucson mega region, sort of, uh, and on the right the two red diagrams, sort of the existing dimension of the mega region and the projected uh, uh, demen uh, the pro projected growth for 2025. Of course, this has changed a little bit in sort of uh, the light of recent uh, um, uh, sort of the recent economy, but it's still one of the largest sort of uh, um, uh, and fastest growing one of the fastest growing mega regions uh, in the United States. And finally, of course, this was our most interesting question, which was to actually be able to give an answer to Rainer Banham, one of my favorite architecture critics, who asked this brilliant question, if this is a desert, what are all these people doing here? So in a way, with this premise, uh, rather than starting the investigation from a specific scale, we actually decided to construct it uh, through a series of, uh, um, of categories, of concepts that would actually allow us to better understand uh, sort of uh, the geography. And the first one uh, was ground. Uh, and for us, ground, sort of an understanding of ground was extremely important uh, because it began to reveal, I think, a very important distinction between the realities of the American desert, right? The idea of, the fl of sort of, uh, uh, of scarcity of water, the flash flood, the uh, 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 sort of, the, the, uh, the, con sort of the, the arid condition of the ground and the conceptions of nature that actually built the geography. And if we actually begin to look, as you'll see in the patterns of urbanization, the desert was seen as a blank canvas that responded more to larger desires of nature uh, at a continental scale, the idea of the noble savage, the idea of the uh, national preserve, the suburban home, um, uh, sort of the, the, uh, the recreational sort of unit, um, and less about the ideas uh, of the desert. And of course, uh, that for, uh, uh, that in many ways has to do with uh, um, uh, sort of uh, answering Rainer Banham's question, which is that all these people are here because it's, they were never desert cities. Phoenix and Tucson were actually never desert cities. They were built over the largest non-replenishable aquifer in the United States, or one of the largest non-replenishable aquifers, and actually had a system of canals initially introduced by the Hohokam tribe uh, and then expanded throughout the 20th century for agricultural purposes that urbanization has actually appropriated. So this idea of, uh, uh, of the desert city, in many ways, um, 
is false due to the existing infrastructure that allowed an overabundance of water for, uh, um, uh, for urbanization. So if we actually begin to look at sort of the logic of, uh, uh, of hydrology, uh, we begin to see that the figure of the Phoenix Tucson mega region is actually very similar to the figure of the aquifer below. Uh, and that if we actually sort of, uh, um, uh, sort of blame uh, private mobility, right, the car for the, develop for the, uh, the development of, of uh, uh, sprawl, uh, I think in Phoenix and Tucson, we can also blame the tube well, the democratization of water through the insertion of the tube well as a form uh, that allowed uh, sort of a large amount of sprawl. So if we actually look at this map, it's showing sort of the proliferation of tube wells, the depth of those tube wells, and how much the water table, and that's very small, but how much the water table has actually decreased in the last, uh, um, um, uh, in the last 100 years. And of course, these begin to show sort of how rivers that actually had a natural flow at the turn of the 20th, uh, of the, uh, of the 20th century today have become sort of extremely, extremely tapped uh, and artificial water machines that pump water into, uh, um, uh, into the mega region. The most sort of famous one being the Central Arizona project that brings water from all the way from sort of the border with California and Nevada uh, to be able to replenish the aquifer in, uh, um, uh, in Tucson. And of course, this has created this relationship where not only is there a huge uh, and abundant amount of water used for ornamental purposes, but a lot amount, uh, large quantities of water are used for ornamental purposes and contained in, uh, um, um, in gated developments where you have, the, uh, until very recently, the tallest water fountain in the world. Uh, and its opposite effect, which is the drying of riverbeds in public lands and the privatization of water in uh, uh, gated communities. You can begin to see here sort of uh, pumping quantities and how, uh, how much those quantities uh, uh, actually uh, uh, sort of increase in areas that are sort of hev very heavily urbanized or, very, uh, or, or that actually still are very heavily um, uh, sort of used for agriculture. And of course, that begins to create, I think, an opposite effect that's extremely problematic, which is the development of subsidence. Um, the uh, 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 areas where water is actually not pumped, the water table has dried, sort of lowered so much that the ground is beginning to crack and you begin to have these huge, huge ravines that are opening in public lands. And once again, public dollars actually going to pay for the repairs of the over pumping of water in, uh, um, in private grounds. And there you can begin to see sort of a, 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 an idea of the scale of, uh, um, uh, of, the scale of, these, uh, uh, of these ravines. Uh, and of course, that in many ways might have to do uh, with, for example, the proliferation of swimming pools. This is not a figure ground of houses. Uh, these are swimming pools. Uh, which on average uh, have exist between 250 to 350 per square mile. Uh, and you can begin to see the density of the entire mega region there in swimming pools and these strips there. Uh, which then led us to uh, begin to look at another category with, which had to do with this idea of uh, cultivation, the idea of agriculture. If, uh, uh, if the city in many ways had followed the agricultural figure, of course the agricultural figure followed the figure of the water and then the city followed the figure of agriculture. You can see sort of this is agriculture in uh, uh, the 1920s, 1930s. Uh, and this is the way the city actually has, throughout the 20th century, 20th century taken over the figure of, uh, 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 of agricultural grounds, resulting in sort of very in intriguing juxtapositions between, uh, 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 between models of urbanism uh, and agricultural land. Uh, so one thing that we were actually very interested in figuring out was if the geometries of agriculture in some way informed the, uh, uh, the organization of the territory. Uh, one, because I think that that would have given you a certain level of efficiency in terms of recycling certain infrastructures. Uh, but also, we, are, we were asking that question primarily for work that we had done previously uh, in New Orleans, where I think the French uh, plantation system developed what, what was quite a smart organizational system in relationship to the river, uh, where a singular sort of system gave you a hydrological system. You actually sort of, here's the river, you take water from the river. Uh, the natural delta, which is an elevated delta, allows for water to slope down and then to be drained in what is the back swamp, right? So a, sim a singular system gives you a hydrological system. It gives you a property ownership system, 
all the parcels are actually subdivided in terms of the frontage that they actually get to uh, uh, the frontage they get on the river and a circulation system. You actually have a, a sort of circulation by boat and circulation by foot along the edges. And that actually became the framework for the urbanization of New Orleans, the subdivision of the plantation uh, through the repetition of the 100 meter by 100 meter block of the French Quarter is what actually allowed for the entire Crescent City, as you can see it here, that's New Orleans, this is sort of Baton Rouge, just kind of like here, for the entire Crescent City to be urbanized, sort of creating a very orderly structured uh, uh, system of growth. Uh, all of these, of course, are called, and if you, if you know New Orleans, they're called Fabourg, and of course, Fabourg in French is the fake city or the city outside of the city. These were seen as the, as the citadels that were actually growing outside of the French Quarter. Uh, but if you actually go back to, uh, to, uh, um, uh, to the Phoenix Tucson mega region, uh, an incorporation of one geometry versus the other one never existed. It was always a process of scraping the existing agricultural geometry and then encapsulating in the one square mile block a new, uh, 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 a, a much more insular model of uh, um, a much more insular model of development, which then led us uh, to investigating sort of the territory from a perspective of fracture or how the territory was actually uh, uh, subdivided. Um, and to be able to examine that, of course, you need to go back out to a continental scale, right? A scale of the, uh, of the entire sort of United States and sort of the development of land uh, from the law ordinance of uh, um, the late 1700s and the establishment of uh, uh, a base in a meridian. And of course, this is a much longer sort of uh, um, uh, lecture, sort of the subdivision of land through a base and a meridian, sort of into six by six square mile uh, grids that then gave you a sector of a mile, uh, of one square mile, and then sort of the subdivision of that sector that actually defined the subdivision of large portions of, uh, of the United States all the way to, uh, to the West Coast. And in that sense, um, uh, uh, the, the territory of Arizona was no exception. And in the late 1800s, 100 years, uh, approximately 100 years after the ordinance, uh, the Salt and Gila River Basin Meridian was established, and the territory was actually platted uh, uh, in a very similar manner to uh, uh, the rest of the United States. And if we actually look at these drawings, this was the projected <laughs> grid on the state, and this is actually the grid, the, the, the agricultural grid that was actually built. These are the differences between the projected grid and the actual grid. Those are the mistakes, the misalignments between, uh, um, uh, between one and the other. Um, of course, here you begin to see, so the only exceptions are, um, uh, are uh, national preserves or Native American reserves, but in the vast majority, the state was sort of uh, platted through the grid. Uh, of course, without taking any consideration to the structure of uh, uh, another sort of gridded system that already existed in the area, which was the Spanish American towns, the Spanish American foundational towns, at moments traversing it, at moments completely ignoring it. Uh, I think resulting in uh, what became sort of a, a quite a unique mosaic of uh, uh, either sort of uh, um, uh, heterotopias or dystopias, depending on your ideological point of view, that begin to sort of always rely on the one square mile grid as a form, uh, um, uh, as a form of development. And you can begin to see here sort of the way that these can actually accommodate sort of uh, an, irrig an irrigation pit as well as a subdivision that uses, you know, a baseball uh, uh, a baseball uh, uh, field as a, a sort of uh, the basic geometry. Uh, but I think uh, for me the larger issue in relationship to this system has to do with the fact that sort of the agricultural system uh, in this region but actually in, in many other places of the United States never developed an urban gridded project that would actually be complementary to that larger sort of agricultural territorial project developing the possibility for the one square mile grid to be the entity that always has to hold a series of insular developments inside, where everything relies on the larger one square mile grid without having a secondary or tertiary gridded system that would allow for multiple scales of urbanism to emerge within the larger uh, logic of the city. And you can begin to see that sort of in the development of a series of development throughout the area, sort of a more chronological evolution of, uh, uh, of projects. Uh, and then here the two extremes, uh, a condition like uh, Sam Hughes in, uh, um, 
in Tucson were actually one of the few examples where a project was actually introduced that negotiated the larger scale of the grid with a smaller scale of the grid, and the opposite example, right? The, the, the utilization of the agricultural plot uh, for sort of a much more insular, um, uh, insular project. Uh, so if we actually begin to look at the current condition of uh, um, uh, the Phoenix Tucson mega region, uh, I think we, we begin to have two sort of extreme conditions that are exemplified by these two photographs uh, of two systems that are completely in many ways uh, uh, operating off the grid. The first one, of course, is a, uh, a, a photograph taken by Life, uh, for Life magazine of Sun City, the largest uh, uh, retirement community in the world, uh, that I think for me is quite fascinating because it begins to exemplify sort of by cr creating sort of this map of the United States, that the project lives to recreate the image of the places where people are coming from and completely negates the image of the space where they actually are living. It completely negates the desert in favor of, in favor of a much more sort of uh, uh, artificial or constructed view uh, of a larger sort of American landscape operating completely off the, uh, the uh, in a completely distant relationship to the desert and then, of course, another picture fr uh, 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 from Life magazine from the 60s and 70s, which is Paolo Soleri and uh, uh, Arco Santi, right, in his initial, uh, begin sort of in, in his modest beginnings. Uh, so, of course, if we look at the reality of these two systems, one completely negates the desert, right, and com it's completely in favor of sort of larger, sort of uh, uh, driven primarily by larger sort of uh, 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 capital pressures. And the other one completely negates sort of larger capital uh, uh, pressures and lives in complete isolation of uh, uh, the larger sort of grid of North America and in, uh, in a, some form of integration with, uh, 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 with the desert, of course. The, the reality looks nothing like the, uh, um, uh, like the model. Uh, so within these two polar opposites, I think that there is the possibility today to begin to rethink uh, sort of the space of the one square mile grid in a more sort of filtered or nuanced manner by looking at the series of parameters that we've actually examined throughout the, uh, um, throughout the work. And this is the mode, sort of the stage at which we are now, this is work in progress, where we're beginning to look at sort of the possibility of the one square mile as a new model of development that might propose an alternative to the existing, uh, uh, to the existing forms of development. Uh, primarily looking at four specific sites, uh, older residential uh, districts uh, closer to the center of Phoenix uh, that sort of because of newer forms of development, because of the crisis, have lost value and today could actually be revamped or rethought with other uses that go beyond, uh, 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 beyond monofunctional residential space. Other areas that are uh, um, um, uh, sort of uh, one square mile projects that have actually been paralyzed through, uh, during construction because of the crisis. Uh, and that today need to be sort of rethought in other, uh, in, uh, um, in, uh, um, in a different light. Uh, one square mile grids that still have agricultural uh, production and that could actually begin to hint towards new forms of, uh, 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 of urbanization that actually capture the geometries of agriculture. And then of course the development of new, uh, um, uh, of, of new one square mile grids within the city. So as we continue to develop sort of uh, these projects, uh, we are actually sort of envisioning new ways in which we can experiment with new forms of density, with new, uh, uh, and these are just working drawings, but uh, new configurations of, uh, um, uh, uh, new configurations of typologies, but also n ways in which sort of larger ecological corridors uh, that exist in the region can actually be allowed to bypass the grid so that sort of uh, um, uh, the grid doesn't just become what actually uh, frames everything inside the, uh, uh, the square, but that there can actually be a larger dialogue that, uh, uh, that allows sort of for multiple systems and multiple scales of connectivity to go beyond uh, uh, that of the one square mile grid, introducing a new gradient of, uh, uh, of movement as well as sort of capitalizing on uh, sort of the lowest points of topography, sort of the, the idea of the, uh, um, uh, of the wash uh, and the f uh, um, uh, sort of on the wash and the capturing of water in the, uh, the rainy season and so on. So as we actually move forward, uh, this is sort of being developed and uh, uh, prepared for a publication and exhibition that should be coming out in, uh, 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 in about two or three months. So uh, with that, I think I'll uh, leave it there and maybe open it up for questions and discussion. Thank you.
speechless. I know. <laughs> Melissa? Yes, uh, about sort of the, the trajectory, right, of the office and sort of how we actually, well, um, actually that's a very interesting question because for us, uh, we are much more interested in looking at a broad array of scales and topics uh, and in many ways developing an angle uh, for, those, uh, 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 for those projects rather than becoming sort of a, a specialist in a particular scale or in a particular, uh, or having a particular set of unique expertise. Uh, so in many ways, uh, a lot of the projects that we actually, um, uh, so uh, in many ways, we're less interested in sort of the type of project, right? They can be very broad, but we're actually more interested in the way that we actually examine it. Uh, and for us, it is always very important to begin to examine it uh, in the way that a particular sort of material fragment, a particular project, might actually sort of within it embed a much larger sort of urbanistic uh, uh, ambition. In the Quito case. Right. Which is, which, right. The Manhattan that you know today is flat. The amount of leveling that went into the construction of the grid is uh, uh, sort of astronomical. Uh, and I think that uh, the level of investment in, 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 of infrastructural investment that actually cities like Manhattan had to be able to sort of create a more sort of continuous horizontal surface uh, uh, is, is, is quite extensive. If you actually take a look, the reason why Central Park, for example, is located where it is is in many ways pragmatic is because it, you act, it's where you actually had the hardest uh, uh, rock and the rock that was most difficult to flatten. But in the case of Quito, you're talking even a more extreme topography. You're talking about sort of differences in 400, 500 meters from sort of the top of a hill to a ravine. Uh, but of course, the, uh, 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 when the grid was imposed, we're talking about sort of the 1500s, uh, it was a form of uh, um, a very particular form of, uh, in a way of modernity, where sort of plans were sent from the Spanish crown. Uh, and the, the plan had to be built in the image of the crown, no matter what. Uh, so basically, as I showed in the plan, the process was to actually use built mass to be able to infill the ravines by hand. Of course, remember, this is the time where sort of it, it was by shovel to be able to infill the ravine in order to actually create an artificial platform that uh, 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 almost like a stage set that would give the effect of horizontality um, in the city. But of course, as the city started to grow beyond sort of in its Republican era, right, in its 1700s, 1800s, that was no longer feasible. And that's where the idea of sort of contour and the iterative block actually comes, uh, um, uh, comes into play. Think, any more questions? There's one minute. Mm-hmm. 
Mm -hmm. Well, I don't think I used the word ecological once. Uh, I might have used ecology, but I, I don't think I used the word uh, ecological uh, once in the lecture. And I think that a lot of the issues that you're speaking about, um, issues of sort of topography, um, uh, so, sort of certain wind, certain elements, certain conditions that, uh, 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 that have to do about environment at large, uh, I don't think are anything new. I think that they've actually been um, uh, within the discipline for, uh, um, uh, been within the discipline for, for, for centuries. Uh, and in that sense, uh, of course, there's a sort of a renewed interest on issues of ecology, on issues of sort of larger, uh, um, uh, sort of larger integration of multiple systems, right? Both uh, um, uh, artificial and less artificial. And in that sense, I think it's important to incorporate them into uh, into the discourse. I don't think that they can actually lead the. Uh, um, uh, I don't think that they can actually be what defines uh, architectural and urban form. I think that there's also uh, a larger cultural ecology that needs to begin to inform that. And, uh, um, uh, and for me, at least in my work and in, uh, uh, in my research, uh, I actually think there's a larger synthesis between sort of uh, um, ecology and the way that it's understood sort of uh, in recent terms and other sort of cultural and, uh, and in many ways sort of uh, physical factors, formal factors, uh, that actually is what comes up to this larger th synthesis that I was talking before. Very good. Thanks again. Okay. Very good. Thank you.